this episode of the Business Communicators. What we want to be looking at when we look at the future is what are those combinations of social, economic, and technological changes that could shift our lives in a moment. You're listening to the Business Communicators, and now your hosts, Austin Stepp, Patty Horn, and Thomas Bain. Welcome to Season 4, Episode 9 of the Business Communicators, the number one podcast in the world for communications and marketing professionals. Again, that's a verifiable fact. My name is Austin Satin, joined alongside my co-hosts Hattie Horn and Thomas Bain on this journey as we explore the world of communications and how it impacts our industry. And before we get things started, I would actually like to dedicate this episode to uh, a, a listener of our podcast who passed away on January 1st, and that's uh, my grandmother. Uh, Mary Rebecca Shelton and uh, Graham, you meant a lot to us all and you'll certainly be missed. So hopefully you're uh, liking and subscribing uh, up there in heaven right now. That would be uh, a great thing for the uh, the algorithm for the podcast. But in just a few moments, we're going to be joined by Jonathan Brill for a discussion on turning disruption into opportunity and futurist. And I think it's going to be a fascinating conversation. And if you want to follow our work, of course, just search at Biz Communicator on all the social media platforms. We're there. And you can, of course, find us at the businesscommunicators.com. But Thomas, Hattie, how was the New Year's for you guys? Did you watch any college football bowl games? What's your prediction for the national championship on Monday night? Uh, let us hear it. My holiday was good. You know, nothing like a long a two day road trip each way with uh, kids in the car. Gives you, <laughs> give, gives you a perspective on some uh, time to reflect and think. Um, but it also, you know, g- gave me the opportunity to work on my communication skills with with, uh, with a two year old, um, or she got to work on her communication skills, depending on how it is. Uh, That'll be a whole number se- separate podcast. That's a whole. That's a whole another conversation. Exactly. Yeah. Another conversation. Exactly. Um, you know, didn't watch a lot of college football. Watched a couple little highlights here and there. National championship. It's a repeat of the SEC championship. I know. Mm. Eh. Mm. So I'm not even going to give a prediction for that because when you play a team multiple times in a year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Howdy. anyway, my, hol- my holiday was good. I spent a lot of time watching Netflix. I got to catch up season two of Emily in Patty. Yeah, if you <laughs> haven't heard about that, I don't know why, but on this podcast, we're big fans of Emily in Paris. Uh, it's not the best, most well written show you by are, any means. You are giving it such, you are so kind. It is the worst written show. I don't watch it for the. And the acting is not the best either. <laughs> but that's not why I watch it. But we it. love it. But we love it. I don't know why. <laughs> the first episode's got a good hook. And and as communicators, yes. it, it, it resonates with all business communicators who are in change. And then all of a sudden, you are addicted to the show is basically what it boils down to. And it. the last episode dealt with crisis. So mm-hmm. it has that in it. So the final episode of season two, you get a little bit of er- and in between, a little bit of everything. So maybe, maybe that's why we like it. There's a little bit of marketing and communications element in there. At yeah. least that's that's why we will say it's a guilty pleasure. No, but it's a yes. show. show. It is a <laughs> it's, 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 it's good. good background. Good background information. Noise. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Let's go ahead and get into uh, today's guest. And so joining us now on the Business Communicators is probably someone who has the coolest job title of any guests that we've had on the show. I take that back. We had a NFL wide receiver on the show, so that's a pretty cool job yeah. title in itself. But business futurist and Inc. Magazine has actually called him a Silicon Valley legend. He's worked with global brands like HP, CEOs, leaders in Hollywood, and is the author of the new book, Rogue Waves. And we would like to officially welcome Jonathan Brill to the Business Communicators podcast. And Jonathan, uh, are you an Emily in Paris fan? Uh, or is there anything on Netflix that uh, Harry. maybe we're sleeping on? <laughs> yeah, not, not yet. I've been digging in on, on Succession uh, and on, uh, on Peacock on, on uh, Yellowstone. Yes. That's the new one. I'm addicted. It's, 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 I mean, it's Dallas and Montana. Yes, it is. <laughs> they, have, they have a spinoff coming of that, right? But it's, it's yeah, prequel. it's like a, it's like a, like it's like a prequel yeah, or whatever a prequel. you want to call it. But that awesome. is the most beautifully shot show. Oh, oh it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. I, I, I worked earlier in my career with a photographer and, uh, uh, yeah, I'd grown up with those Marlboro ads and I thought, oh my God, they hired the best photographers on the planet. And the answer is no, they go up to Bozeman and they throw cameras in the air. <laughs> like that's how it works. It is so beautiful up there. Yes. Gorgeous. 
Absolutely. If you, if you like cinematography, there's one show that I would recommend to everyone, and yeah. it's Formula One Drive to Survive. And they have three seasons out that are right now, season four, documenting uh, Max Verstappen's season win or championship win this year will come out, I think, sometime in February or March. But it's just a beautifully done, like, from cinematography-wise and storytelling. So be sure to be on the lookout for that. But, Jonathan, I've mentioned on the show, you know, probably dozens of times that, you know, maybe what worked – five years ago doesn't work now and what works now is not going to work in five to 10 years. And can you kind of walk us through what a futurist is kind of what you do, how that title yeah. kind of came about and you know, maybe how you work with business leaders to equip them for success when sometimes the future is relatively unknown. The, the, the funny and true answer is I uh, got a job at HP where I was working on their long-term strategy and I got my business card and it said global futurist on it. I had no idea. Uh, but what, what, I, <laughs> what I really do is I, I think it's a good title. Uh, I, I help large organizations primarily figure out where they need to be one, three, five, ten years from now. And, and I've done that some in the marketing communication space for um, the U.S. government uh, had to build a World's Fair pavilion in 2015. And they had to uh, communicate the theme of the World's Fair was uh, about the future of food. So I had to understand what really uh, do we need to do between now and 2050 to feed the planet? And, and what is the, the U.S. global food policy? And so we had to, to kind of take this $12 trillion industry, global industry, and, and chunk it down into a story that we could tell you know, to people in multiple languages uh, who really just want to go and get a stromboli. Uh, in about 30 minutes. So that's, that's a lot of, a lot of what I do is, is taking massive amounts of information that we actually know about the future, combining it so that we can actually make uh, meaningful decisions doing that, that synthesis. It's kind of interesting sometimes when we see, you know, things play out in front of us, we don't realize how rapidly things change. You know, we look at uh, our iPhones. This is something that we rely on so much right now. Uh, but 10 years ago, you know, I was using a BlackBerry and things rapidly change. And you kind of talk about that and, uh, you know, uh, to an extent in a TED talk that you did about, you know, food and, you know, tomato and how, you know, that kind of evolved. And I think this is a TED talk you did in like 2015, 2016. Um, we'll link to it, uh, you know, in the show notes below. Uh, can you kind of walk us through that and maybe how sometimes the past can, you know, outline, you know, maybe how, how we, perceive the future or how we, you know, connect with the future. Yeah. So, so we think about tomatoes as universal, um, you know, so we eat them every day. Uh, it turns out that wasn't really true uh, in most of the world until after world war one and, and e even most of Europe until after world war one. And why was that? The Spanish uh, went obviously to, to, to um, the Americas and explored the Americas and they brought back this thing that was tomato like it was this yellow kind of sour fruit. And uh, the Spanish didn't like it, ended up in Italy. The it, Italians hybridized it and made it the sweet, you know, red thing that we get today. Um, and it was popular in Italy, but it didn't really expand out of Italy until the rail, uh, rail lines, uh, you know, just prior to World War I, uh, allowed real transport across the across the continent and then with world war one you had this mass move these mass movements across the continent and, and that's when it started to become popularized my point is that these things that can sit around for 500 years you know can explode in in moments uh, because of a technological change because of a political issue or political change uh, because of an economic change and what we want to be looking at when we look at the future is what are those combinations of social, economic, and technological changes that could shift uh, our lives in a moment, right? I, I like to think of it as what I call a rogue wave, uh, convenient uh, product. Um, <laughs> I love it. Here. I recently wrote a book called Rogue Waves. Um, but the idea is that, that, you know, unmanageable things, things like COVID, right? They, they are the result of individually manageable events that, that overlap to suddenly, uh, individually manageable ways of change that overlap to suddenly become these hundred foot monsters that we can't uh, manage. So when you take a look at something like COVID, when I was at HP, we were tracking uh, the likelihood of a zoonotic respiratory pandemic, believe it or not, um, because of some technologies we were building that were relevant 
to to that um, that, that would be uh, really useful if if there was a huge respiratory pandemic. And what we saw was a whole bunch of changes in the world that took these like one in a hundred year chance of of, of disaster issues. Um, and suddenly made them about one in 12 year issue. And so what was going on? So we saw uh, mass urbanization, right? In, in China of, of 400 million people since I think 1995 have moved into cities. Uh, that's the population larger than the United States. When you do that, you cut those cities out into the wilderness, out into the biome, you create uh, more interaction between wildlife and people, right? Uh, you saw a explosion of international travel out of China between 2012 and 2019. We saw a 10 times increase in international travel out of China, moving them from an irrelevant tourism spender to the largest tourism spender on the planet. You know, I, I could get into the four or five other things that, uh, that overlapped to create this rogue wave that, that is COVID. But what was a one in a hundred year issue uh, was suddenly becoming more likely. And, and we actually saw that potential pandemics were happening more frequently. We were just getting better at, at containing them. And so we didn't notice in the West that, that this shift was occurring because we were looking at, you know, what, what's the last data point, right? When was the last time one of these things hit us as opposed to what's the likelihood, uh, what are the drivers of these things hitting us uh, moving forward? And that's why eight of the 10 largest companies, publicly held companies in the U.S., failed to identify pandemics as a risk, you know, when they should have. It was really obvious when you started looking at the data that while we might not have been able to precisely calculate the risk, it wasn't a one in a hundred. It was a one in 10 or one in 20. So, so you sit here and you talk about the, the, the metrics that you were using or the, the indicators you were using. I love the site Casual, Co or Casual Correlations, where uh, the number of Nicolas Cage movies goes up, the number of uh, suicides go up. Uh, how do you help, how, how do you identify which metrics companies should be looking at? Or Because we can pull any number or any leading yeah. indicator out of the air. How do you help sift through that to get to where you can say, this is what we think might happen in the next three to five, 10, 12 years? That's a, that's a great question. And, and, and I like that you put a time bound on it, right? What's, what's the likelihood in this amount of time? Because anything's possible in infinity, right? Um, so we want to look at what's the range of possible futures in the timeline that we're, we're talking about. Uh, I, I think about five major skills we need to have in our organizations to look at the future. And, and I think about it kind of like the, um, you know, the, the goldfish problem, that the goldfish is in its bowl and it doesn't know that it's in water because it's always been in water, right? Um, that's true with all of us, with the skills that we have for projecting, for looking at the future. And they primarily start when we're um, in college, right? If you're an English major, you, you learn how to think about the big picture, what, what might be possible if, if the rules changed, right? You can do science fiction thinking. Um, if you're a lawyer, you learn really good logical skills, right? You learn how to like take that, that universe of, of facts that we know and, and, and figure out what must be true from that. If you uh, get a degree in a scientific method, um, or scientific field, you know, you learn inductive thinking, right? Like what's the most likely thing to be true based on the information uh, that we have right now? So, so those are, those are major ways of looking at the world, inductive, deductive, abductive thinking uh, are, are what philosophers call it. And, and then there's one more, which is called Bayesian reasoning, which is kind of what economists do. Right. They look at large sets of information, they model them. And based on you know, a change in input here or a change in input there or an acceleration of this widget here, um, what, what are the range of possible outcomes? If we want to look at the future in a meaningful way, what's going to happen in the next one, three, five, seven, ten years? You need to have all of those competencies to, to, to be able to create a full spectrum picture of what the future looks like. And these aren't hard to do. You probably have a lot of these competencies in your organization. What you need to do is be aware that your competencies are probably different than other people's and, and pull them all into the conversation, pull them all into the process. It's funny that you'd say that in terms of being aware of people with certain type of competencies and capabilities. And we've been saying this for years. 
but why in your from your perspective uh leaders or executives are blind to those things i mean when you talk about the future of work mm -hmm. as a whole mm -hmm. and after this entire pandemic thousands of people were quitting their jobs because they just refused mm -hmm. to be uh, th their behavior changes how they wanted to be treated or how they wanted work to be for them. But it seems like leaders haven't really taken a good look at that and saying, Hey, well, what do I need to be doing differently? We talk about the future, but it seems like people are still stuck. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Why, why, why are people still stuck? Because their economic interests are in, in a historical paradigm. Um, I think that's the main reason. Um, you know, it's what what was uh, I forget who, who who said it, but something like you know, it's awful hard to to convince a man of something that his uh, of something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. You know, um, I, I think that there's a lot to be said for that, and and I think we need to be looking at how do we compensate, how do we incentivize organizations. Uh, specifically, how do we incentivize C-suites? Because if you have a, a, a incentive structure like uh, Tim Cook has at, at Apple, where you know he doesn't get really paid out for ten or fifteen years, you know, guess what happens when you've got a coin-operated executive? <laughs> you know, uh, you 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 get ten or fifteen-year perspectives. If you take a company and you 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 take your C-suite and you say, hey, we're going to comp you on the quarter, we're going to comp you on the year, we're going to comp you on you know, uh, what you do while you're here as opposed to the impact of what you've done after you leave, you, you get a very different, uh, you get a very different outcome. You know, when you take a look at a company like Amazon and, and how they do their hiring and, and how they do their compensation, basically the first two years, you know, you don't, you don't get like a performance bonus. Um, and you don't get paid out, you know, your, your stock, your RSU vesting, it really until years three and four. You know, and, and then it's increasingly about about long term stock valuation. Right. And, and it's not about what did you do today? It's about what's the value of what you did today, tomorrow. And so I think we need to start thinking about our organizations in that way. If we want that kind of long term performance, we've got to bring our employees into the same value dynamic that we have our leaders in. Um, so I guess that's one side. There's a second piece that I think is really important within that, which is as we've pushed toward this idea of shareholder value since the 1970s, that that really the 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 the, the primary driver of the organization is is the stock price as opposed to um, uh, the the the, the long-term career structure of the employee. You know, we've we've created a much more uh, transactional relationship with employees. If we want to have longer term, better relationships with employees, I think we need to rethink that in, in a pretty profound way. When I think of the term futurist, you know, you mentioned like Tim Cook and, you know, Steve Jobs is in that same similar mindset. I mean, we're seeing the impact of Steve Jobs still with Apple, you know, years after he's passed. And a lot of business leaders like look to someone like him for, you know, almost inspiration. And when I think of the term, you know, futurist, Elon Musk kind of comes to mind and we sure. spoke on him in the last episode of the podcast because he was times person of the year but you know while he's currently building cyber trucks and launching rockets into orbit you know that's only his short-term objective you know his long-term right. outlook for tesla is it's not a car company it's a battery company and he's doing that to create a sustainable future he's got mm -hmm. you know satellites for internet and to help bring people up from poverty and so they can access information uh, when they can't right now and if all of that doesn't work out you know he wants to colonize the cosmos and uh I, you know it, it's very forward thinking at least from his perspective so i'm curious from your end outside of you know tim cook steve jobs elon musk which companies or leaders do you see right now that are innovators in this space in terms of forward thinking and thinking outside of the present and looking towards that future i, I think when you look at all of those leaders that that you mentioned uh, minus tim cook um What's really interesting is when Steve Jobs came back, uh, all, all of them have had a very coherent uh, strategic concept for, for decades. 
if you look at Steve Jobs' talk at the uh, Computer Museum, I guess, in, in San Jose, and maybe it's 1982 or 1983, he's talking about you know Moore's Law, this idea that computers will move faster on a relatively reliable rate, and, and what he's going to do with that. Right. And he's going to use it to remove code. He's going to the, the, the skills you need to use these devices and, and to make them more human experiences. And he's really clear about that in, in 1980, you know, and it wasn't or 1982, 1983. And it wasn't really clear at that point that his idea was a winner, you know, and, and when he took over Apple again, you know, like the company had what, you know, less than six months of cash. Right. Like it, it was in a hard state. It wasn't really clear he was going to be a winner. But I think what he did was he had a very uh, he, he had a basic concept of the relationship of economics and physics and, and, and how he was going to use that over time. I think that was a really coherent idea. I think when you take a look at Elon Musk, right, coming out of PayPal, I don't know that it was super clear that he was a winner. He, he, he got lucky. Um, uh, but clearly he's been lucky enough times that it's not luck anymore. Right. Like there was, there was some, there was some method to the madness. Um, but, you know, coming out of it, he had a really strong strategic concept, right. Which is, I am really concerned about, about carbon issues. Right. And I want to figure out how to do that. I want to figure out how to get into heavy manufacturing in ways that, uh, allow me to take advantage of government incentives, drive government incentives in many ways, and do things that established companies can't. And by the way, I've got, you know, I've got a pile of tens of millions of dollars in my back pocket to make a couple of bets. And I'm going to make, you know, he thought they were probably seven year bets, and they turned out to be 20 year bets. Um, not something that many of us can do. But he looked at that long term future. And he said, here's how I'm going to think about it. Here's my strategic concept, right? And when you take a look, and it's about carbon emissions, I want to, I want to solve that. And when you take a look at the, I'm going to go to Mars idea, like, yeah, sure. Maybe we're going to go to Mars, but the economics on that probably don't work out uh, according to Stephen Petronek, who's an expert on that subject for another, you know, hundred years, 70 years. Um, so that's not actually an economic objective. What, what's his economic objective? The economic objective is even if we fail at that, we've done all of the things we need to do if we're going to put a million people on Mars to create self-sustaining carbon neutral cities on earth far before we ever do the science fiction future. And that's, that's the strategic concept. And so I would ask if you're a leader today, you know, we don't know if you're going to be a winner 20 years from now, but what's your strategic concept? Is it tied to social change? Is it tied to economic change? And is it tied to technological change? And is it in line with policy objectives as they'll roll out um, uh, as those other pieces shift? Because that's really what these guys uh, figured out. For companies who because I think thinking futuristic is, is a mindset. It's about behavior as well. What are some of the things that you do uh, or what can people do to, what type of the steps can they take if they wanted to apply or, you know, your advice or the things that they needed to do? What is the first step? So I think there are, there are five steps uh, conveniently. Um, uh, there's this an acronym because uh, I'm a consultant these days uh, called Rogue, uh, which is conveniently linked to my book Rogue Waves. Uh, and there are five things you need to be able to do. One is reality test, right? The world's moving faster. Our assumptions are more and more likely uh, to be wrong. Two, uh, observing systems, right? What's really going on in the system and, and what small thing maybe upstream of you could create a massive change downstream of you. So, so, you know, what if there was a pandemic, for instance, you know, how would that impact your supply chains and your go to market and your retail and, and your marketing and everything else, right? Because the, these small things, you know, they, they build up, they, they snowball, right? The third is uh, um, figuring out how do you generate the range of possible futures? When we uh, do 
market analysis, right? It's so easy to say, hey, we're going to do 6% better or worse than last year, right? But the reality that we discovered uh, over COVID is that in the same year, you can have an AMC year uh, where you almost go bankrupt. You take on a billion dollars and the CEO says you still might go bankrupt. Or you can have a Zoom year where you do 26 times growth. The, the, the executive teams of both companies were competent. They had good strategies going into the year. But you can have a broad range of possible futures. It's not just the small, medium, and large t-shirt and you know, t-shirt sizes. And so you want to be looking at the bigger picture. And then how do you uncouple threats from opportunities, right? One of the big challenges that we see in organizations that are suddenly faced with, you know, uh, uh, an, an opportunity like Zoom or like Amazon had is they don't have the ability to execute because, because the, as the opportunity increases, the risk increases too, the threats increase too. And so, and so that sinks the company. Uh, and then the last piece is experimentation. So when you think about a, a company like General Motors, right? Like you can say they're not an innovative company. They are. When you take a look at their R&D spend since World War II, they are an incredibly innovative company. Um, but why are they playing catch up today? And why does their business model, why is their business model not appropriate for where they need to go in the future? And the answer goes back to how they thought about experiments. So there are two ways you can do experiments, right? Uh, when you want to do innovation, you can look at them as a portfolio, uh, or you can do what's called trialing, where you do one, you make a better car, better car, better car, better car, better car, better car, and then all of a sudden you've made an electric vehicle that goes 150,000 miles without a tune-up, and your business model break, blows up because your entire plan is that you're going to sell a new car. Uh, to dealers who are then going to sell it to consumers who are then going to own it for three years and they're going to maintain their free cash flow uh, by doing maintenance on that car. All of a sudden that blows up, your business blows up. There's another way of looking at innovation and it's the thing that I think uh, pharmaceutical companies do really well, which is, which is the portfolio approach, just like you would... Um, you know, when you look at, at stocks, right? You, you want to have, you know, some, some high risk, high payoff things, you know, some knock a ding in the universe kinds of web three NFT types of things, right? Maybe it's a trillion dollar thing. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's the next Cabbage Patch Kids. We don't know. Uh, the second <laughs> is, you know, what are their regular payoff, you know, regular reward risk profile things that we're going to do. And then the third, the third bucket is, you know, what are those insurance investments? What are those insurance experiments that make sure that no matter what happens, you know, the, 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 the house doesn't burn down. And for every company that that mix of, of what's high, medium and low risk, high, medium and low reward is different, but you want to be looking at, you know, do you have the right combination of experiments so that no matter what happens, you know, uh, and no matter which one succeed, you get the right payoffs on the right timelines. And so when we look at how do you start to think about the future in a more specific way, more coherent way, it's really those five things. How do you reality test? How do you observe systems? How do you generate the range of futures? How do you uncouple threats and opportunities? And then how do you experiment in portfolios? Great tips, great advice, great insights in this uh, you know interview, Jonathan. And for our listeners out there that, you know, maybe they want to learn more about you, what you do, uh, you know, maybe find the new book, Rogue Waves. What is the best way for them to, you know, get in touch or, you know, follow the the work that you're doing? You can find me on on LinkedIn. I, I put out something pretty much every day there. Uh, I'm published regularly in HBR, Forbes, um, uh, sometimes in, in Fast Company. Um and the best place to find me if, if you don't follow me on LinkedIn is on my website, jonathanbrill.com. We'll definitely link to all of that in the show notes below. So if you're watching this on YouTube, just scroll down, click on Jonathan's information, or you, if you're listening on Spotify, iTunes, whatever, just scroll down, click on the links there. But Jonathan, it was so great to have you on the Business Communicators podcast, and we wish you the best of luck with the, uh, the Rogue Waves book. Thanks, man. It's wonderful to see you. Wonderful to hear you. Great conversation. And happy Netflixing, happily Emily in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining. All right, thanks, Jonathan. 
Well, that was a fun, uh, you know, conversation, guys. Yeah. Uh, I, I kind of nerd mm. out on that kind of stuff, you know, because, you know, science fiction is, you know, fun. It's kind of a mind escape. And when you start to look into the future of companies and, and think what is possible, I think, you know, it, it, it's, you know, the science fiction that, that comes becomes a reality. And we see a lot of businesses doing you know, outlooks, we look at the energy industry, for example, you know, they do the energy outlooks to 2050, you know, they're mm -hmm. looking at these long term targets. And is some of it going to happen? Sure. Is all of it going to happen? Maybe not. But it gets people thinking and pushing the envelope. And I think that's what we're all about as you know, communications professionals, uh, you know, being disruptive, where we can to create meaningful change. I agree. Again, if you can dream, it, you can make it happen. You might not necessarily be able to make it. But you can, you can at least add to the storyline. Uh, I know in my consulting world, I always say, where do you want to go? Let's start there and then let's see where you are now and let's figure out how to get there versus, oh, well, we need to add this cog. We need to add that cog. Well, what's that cog going to do? Yeah. 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 I always remember that, you know, it's a mindset and companies are run by people. People have to have that mindset and thinking ahead and thinking about the future and what will you know, how to impact not just their business, but the world and, and other people and countries. And I love what uh, Elon Musk is doing. He's, he's thinking not just about himself. He's thinking about how to have a sustainable future for a world that is really, really in need. And he's not the only one. I mean, there's so many people yeah. from all walks of life. Oh, life. Absolutely. I mean, you've got like Greta Thunberg, who's what, 16, 17 years old, absolutely. Uh, you know, doing the same thing. She's She recognizes a uh, potential problem. Uh, you know, climate and, you know, she's maybe not creating a business to do it, but she's creating advocacy outlets. And oh, absolutely. It's, it's, it's great to see what the human mind is capable of. Absolutely. Yeah, I love it. Well, if you want to, you know, follow Jonathan and his work again, just scroll down in the, the show notes below and connect with them on LinkedIn. Check out his new book, Rogue Waves. We'll leave a, uh, a link to buy it on Amazon in the show notes as well. So definitely support him. But, you know, when we talk about the future, uh, Thomas actually sent us uh, an article Friday morning from Reagan, and it was uh, it, it was an interesting one. So Lake Superior State University, they have an annual list of words that are banished, uh, you know, words, phrases. So things that you shouldn't use in the future, right? Like different phrases. Uh, and it's, I guess, a tradition that's gone back since like 1976. And uh, the list comprises submissions from around the world. So I'm going to go ahead and read. And I guess if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see it on the screen. Uh, the 10 words that they've identified. Wait, what? No worries. <laughs> At the end of the day, that being said, asking for a friend, circle back, deep dive, new normal, you're on mute, <laughs> and supply chain. Uh, I think I use at least half of those. I was I about to say, me too. Ooh. <laughs> Especially no worries. I, I was about to oh, say, I say the, that all the time. The yeah. what I don't like is no worries. I've been saying that since like the nineties. Like, hey, no worries, man. Let's keep going. <laughs> exactly. That's one yeah. that I am definitely going to keep in mind for now. I so. but you know what's so weird? I didn't <laughs> learn that word till I came to work in the energy industry, and I heard no like, oh, I really? never. No, yes, I, we don't say it. I mean, my culture, I don't say that. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> So, but I, but I was listening to, I was like, oh, okay, that must be a, and, and then I started saying it. It's amazing when you're around people a lot of time, you start picking up all the words, you start saying, I say, no worries. Well, some people say it in like a passive aggressive way. Yeah. And that's where, you know, the tech, the whole text message thing, you know, mm -hmm. kind of comes into play. But uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, my word is no problem. You know, I, was, yeah. I, I grew up on no problem. And so when I heard no worries, when I got to the company, I was like, what do they mean by that? I, I do I do like that new normal is taken out. I agree. Deep dive. I'm glad. I mean, that, new normal to me is basically, you know, being complacent with the status quo. Yeah. I'm not a fan of that. It gets on my nerves. The the new normal was net, was interesting the first three to six months of, of COVID because it was like, hey, we need to learn how to live with what's going on right now. But now it's He's tired, over like, you. Get out of here. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> At some point in time, it's got to be normal. Walk yeah. away. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's. Oh, one thing you list. take out to normalized. I hate that word. <laughs> You know, this list Let's kind of reminded that. me, this this list reminded me. So when I used to work in sports as a sports information director, I was at Louisiana Tech 
And uh, it was the first year that Sonny Dykes was the head coach. And he had just come from Texas Tech. I think he was like the offensive coordinator there uh, or a quarterback coach or something like that. But anytime he was in a press conference, his go-to bridging phrase was it's just like anything else. It's just like anything oh. else. And we would set like over <laughs> under on how many times he would say it in a press conference. And while of course you can't have like alcohol in a press conference, you know, a lot of red flags there. Uh, we, we would kind of make jokes like, all right, every, you know, we'll set the over under at nine and a half or every time he says it, you know, it's like a drinking game. You got to take a shot. Uh, but he's, he's, he was the football coach at SMU this past year. And now he's, he's the new head coach at TCU. And uh, my former colleague at La Tech is now a sports information director at TCU. And so I was like, Hey, you got to bring this tradition back. Anytime he says, uh, it's just like anything else. He's like, uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> What's going through my mind is the, how I met your mother, where Robin decided uh, is the weather girl and hers was, but um, and all the kids were staying up till 4am and playing the drinking game with it. And then when she caught on, <laughs> Ted's like, no, no, stop the drinking game now. And like everybody the next morning is like just not able to move or function. Yeah. So if you hear any of these words, we're not encouraging you to drink on command. Uh, uh, you know, and, and I'm sure if you were doing like an office day, actually, if you want to, if you want to stay energized during the workday, uh, you know, get some coffee, get, you know, a growler of coffee, if you will. And anytime you're on a Zoom call. And someone says one of these 10 words, wait, what? No worries. At the end of the day, that being said, asking for a friend, circle back, deep dive, new normal, you're on mute, supply chain. You will stay energized throughout the entire day. I guarantee it. Zoom guarantee office it. bingo. Let's start playing it. <laughs> Just well, don't tell I your boss it. who you're matching it to. <laughs> Well, guys, it's been a fun episode of uh, the Business Communicators podcast. And again, we want to thank Jonathan Brill for joining on uh, joining us on this show. And and, and do we have any takeaways? Uh, you know, uh, not necessarily from what we discussed, but you know, our general weekly takeaways or anything that we need to send our audience home with this week. And and Thomas, I'll start with you. You know, I'm a little I'm a little heartbroken that you didn't put up our titles this time. I changed my title to "Want to Be Futurist" for this podcast alone. <laughs> um, I. Uh, you know, it, it's a new year. Turn over a new leaf. Keep going. Uh, as we record this, we're one day past January 6th. Uh, took place. And, and find ways to bridge those gaps. Find ways to tear down the walls. Find ways to to drive your business. Find ways to drive your personal brand. Don't be stuck on what happened yesterday or in 2021 or 2020. Let's think about what's going to happen in 2022 and just keep moving forward. Yeah. Keep yeah, pushing. And, yeah. You? And even as you move forward and keep pushing, be consistent. Yeah. Um, because it is going to take time, but if you stay consistent in what you're doing, you'll see the light at the end of the tunnel. You'll start seeing success because that's a that's some of those you know when we talk about the future and everything changes and everything that's true. It, it, change is consistent, <laughs> consistently happening. So that for me is something that I always think about. Yeah. Would the change be the new normal? No. <laughs> that, well, uh, well, asking for a friend. Thomas, you're banned. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and put you in the green room. Hattie and I will finish the show. So. <laughs> He's a Just kidding. Out. Just kidding. I was about to say they actually you're put back, me in Thomas. the green room. I was about to start typing. Yeah, I had to put you in timeout, Thomas. We'll be first. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I guess mine is actually kind of uh, the, you know, the hoodie that I'm wearing. It's uh, You Matter. So uh, just remember that 2022, you know, as time gets tough, uh, you matter. Uh, focus on yourself and uh, focus on your family, friends, uh, and, and live life to the fullest. That's uh, incredibly important. But great episode, guys. I, I really enjoyed it. And again, if you want to follow our work, just search at Biz Communicator on all the social media platforms. You can connect with us on LinkedIn. Our bios are on our website, thebusinesscommunicators.com. And again, we'll be doing some TikTok dances, maybe some movie recs on uh, on our uh, you know TikTok account here in the upcoming weeks maybe maybe not i don't know Had, hattie maybe uh, i don't know but uh special thanks again to our guest this week uh jonathan brillen again you can uh check out his new book rogue waves uh we'll include a link in the show notes below and if you want to connect with him on linkedin social media his website all of that information is down below in the uh in, in the show notes but on behalf of my co-host this week hattie horn thomas bain my name is austin staten we'll see you next week take care everyone You've been listening to The Business Communicators. If you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and leave us a five-star review.